Every year I have trouble getting into the Christmas spirit. I don't know about y'all. Sometimes it's just a little bit more difficult for me to, to get in the mood of Christmas. I know all the songs are on the radio. I know that the Christmas lights are there and the parades, all the floats with crowded with people throwing out candy to those that are on the side of the road. All the Christmas clothes, those ugly sweaters, the snowmen in every yard, Santa on every corner, the Christmas trees with all the lights and all the, well, they're just loaded down with presents, especially at our house. The traffic, the worn out credit cards, the sugary desserts, all those things that we love, the hustle and bustle, and the hurried life. And yet we say that we know and understand that Jesus is the reason for the season. And we may even say that to someone else. Jesus is the reason for the season. And when we do say such, they just smile at us and take a drink from their double mocha latte and scurry off to find that last toy on their Christmas list. It's truth that America loves Christmas. We do love Christmas, and we love the joy of Christmas as far as we understand it, yet we spend very little thought to the understanding of God's love that was given to every soul in the world. A while back, I was thinking about what direction I was going to go to today, and I had something else kind of in my mind and in my thoughts, but I decided this year I just wanted to share the Christmas story of God's love and God's gift from John chapter 3. So if you have your copy of God's Word, stand with us now in honor of reading God's Word, and we will read from John chapter 3. By the way, Melba, you did a great job with the choir. I appreciate it. She came in and she said, hey. And I said, I guess you're going to be singing bass with uh, Virgil. And she said, we'll see. You did good. John chapter 3. You there, say amen. You're not there, say wait. And let's go. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. I have told you earthly things and you do not believe. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For not God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved." God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Let's pray. 
Father, we never underestimate the power of the Word of God, the reading of the Word of God. The Spirit that You put into our presence when You draw us to the truth of the Word of God. That wooing that is necessary, and it, necess it, it brings us to the brink of Your presence. And Lord, we are stirred in our spirit by your goodness. And I pray that today. I pray that for everyone who hears this message in the room or online, Lord, we thank you for both. But Lord, most importantly, and the greatest thing I pray for is that Jesus, you will be high and lifted up. And that if you are, you would draw all people to you. For without you, not only can we do nothing, we are nothing. We thank you for the gift of Christmas. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for the power that changes lives. Lord, we know that you desire this more than we do. So I pray, Lord, that you awaken us to the work of Christ this morning. Lord, all is vain if you don't speak, but if you speak, miracles can happen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. This is the, simply the story of a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a rich, respected, religious ruler. He was a righteous man as far as the world would say it, as far as the law was concerned, but we know that the Bible also tells us that there is none righteous, no, not one. So even though Nicodemus knew Scripture and he knew where Scripture pointed to, there was still something like the choir just sang about that was an unsettled heart seeking truth. When Jesus had come to Jerusalem, he had gone to the temple. And Nicodemus and the others had saw him as he created quite a stir in the temple as he did what, what the Scripture calls is cleansing the temple. He could not stand what was going on there in the temple when the temple was supposed to be the, God's place. That was a place of worship. So he went in there and ran all those people who were doing other things out of it. And he did it with such zeal and passion, a passion that Nicodemus said, maybe only the Messiah would have this type of passion and do such a thing. So with a wondering heart, an interested heart, he came at nighttime under the veil of darkness for whatever reason, but he wanted to be secluded with Christ to be able to answer, ask him some questions. And he came to learn, and, and, and he said to them in verse 1, he said, he said, or verse 2, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. That was his basis of truth. But Jesus got to the very heart of the subject here. And in verse 3, he just didn't beat around the bush at all. He said, most assuredly, barely, barely, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless a man is born again, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Unless a man is born again. In Nicodemus, we see someone who has all that culture could give, a very religious person with all the training and the moral rules of what everything that man could do. But yet he hears these words, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What a wonderful illustration. When a baby is born, he has no past. The future is ahead of him. Everything lies ahead of him and when one comes to know Jesus Christ, the past is taken care of. Only the future lies ahead. Nicodemus, when he heard this, said, how can this be? I don't understand this. So Jesus gave two quick illustrations. 
He said, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. And here is his illustrations. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That takes us back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. When God created the world, did you hear me there? This world didn't evolve. God created it. And there's some words that, that God put there that are so important to us. It says, each one is born after its kind. The fruit of a pine tree will make another pine tree. The fruit of a peach tree will make another peach tree. You never see a blend there. A lion will beget a lion. A leopard will beget a leopard. And a human being will create another human being. 46 chromosomes within it, 21 from the father, 23, excuse me, 23 from the father, 23 from the mother put together. The DNA is there. You make what you are after its kind. That which of the flesh is flesh after its kind. That which of the spirit is spirit. After its kind. In Romans 5, we understand the Word of God says that, that ever since Adam, we've been born into this human fleshly nature, a sin nature. A dog barks because it's a dog. That's just what dogs do. And because we have a sin nature, we sin because we were born into sin. And it's always been that way, and it always be, will be that way. So simply put, we need to be born again. Not simply of the flesh and the sin nature, but we need to be born of the Spirit with the nature of God. We must be born again. He gives a second illustration in verse number 8. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from. And where it goes, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. I think it's kind of cool here that when you look at this, the same word in the Greek and in the Hebrew, both together, the same word for spirit and wind is the same. So we would speak of it as wind. It could easily be translated Spirit, it's invisible, but it can be sensed, and the presence of both is revealed in the effect. When the wind is blowing, you can't see, you don't know where it's coming from, you really don't know where it's going, but you sense that it's there. And when you look at the trees and the leaves and everything around it, you can feel you, you know it's there by the effect of what the wind does. The Spirit of God, though it may be invisible, it can be sensed. It can be felt. And you know that it is there by the effect of what that Spirit does. And praise God that the Spirit of God that is seeking after us comes. And though we don't see it, we sense it and know it, and there's an effect that happens in our life. If you are a Christian, you know that effect. Matter of fact, if you are lost, you might be feeling the effect of it as it is drawing you to the very presence of God. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 14, Paul said to the church at Corinth, he said, but the natural man, that is the one that is born in the flesh. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So they can't help it unless the Spirit comes, blows upon them, and reveals himself to them. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Then Jesus gets real personal here. He draws a line in the sand. Y'all know what I mean when I say that? 
When you draw a line in the sand, there's a, div there's a division there. On one side, you see one thing. You, you, if you're going to cross over, you, there's something totally different on the other side of it. And he uses the illustration here of we and you. Looking back in verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. How would he know that? Because he sensed it. And because he saw the effect of how it was working in people's lives. Lives were being changed. People were being stirred. People were, were losing their, their frustration and their unhappiness and finding the peace of God in him. People were being miraculously changed. We know that you're a teacher from God. But listen to Jesus' words here in verse number 10. Are you, that's the term for them, for Nicodemus, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, here's the trans, translation, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. He's talking about him and, him and the disciples and, and the ministry that they're doing. He says, we know, but you, right? Nicodemus said, now, we all believe. And he says, you don't believe like we believe. You, you, you look at it one way, but I'm telling you, we look at it another way. You, you, you don't understand, but the way that you're on is a broad way. But the way that I'm on is a narrow way. You may see this as a mystery, he says in verse 12. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And then he gave what I believe is the great Christmas story. Look in verse 13. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. We needed something in this world. And before the foundation of the world, as the Trinity was together, they said, let's do this. But if we do this, Jesus, you're going to have to go. You're going to have to leave the bliss of heaven. You've heard me say this many times. He took off the robes of glory and laid them down, willing to leave everything that was about him to come to a world where we wanted everything to be about us. And he was born in human flesh through the Virgin Mary. And he submitted himself to the Spirit of God, and he, he lived a sinless life. And he was given a body so that it could be sacrificed. And he even talks about the sacrifice. Verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. As the children of Israel were in the wilderness, and they were taking the, the track, and they got griping and complaining and fussing and they were mad at God because God was leading them there and they were they said we're tired of this bread why did you take us out of Egypt to lead let us be here <clears throat> and God allowed serpents to come and begin to bite the people and they begin to die there in the wilderness. And as they prayed and cried out, Lord, help us. As they prayed and cried out, God told Moses to take a serpent, an image, and put it on a pole and raise it up. And whoever looks to it and believes will be healed what the serpent has done. Moses did not even realize in the last 
time that the miracle of God would happen through Moses' life, it was a picture of what God would do. That there we were dying in our sins. But if we would look up to the cross of Jesus Christ, where he would be lifted up, where he could draw all people to him, the one from heaven, the pure one from heaven, came to die, to be sacrificed for our sins. So we see verse 15, he says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Suppose we could get Jacob's ladder and we could begin to climb that illustrious ladder up into the places of glory. And we could get to the top and we could peek through the other side and see the Shekinah glory of God and see the stand on the golden pavement of heaven. And we could look around and we could see Gabriel there who is one who we are told that stands in the very presence of God. And, and maybe we could go to, to, to Gabriel and say, how much does God love the world? I don't think that Gabriel could say it any better than John penned it here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because love is stronger than death. A love that will not let you go. A love that never fails. These 25 words in John 3.16 have been memorized. The very first scripture in all of, of the Bible that I ever memorized myself. And they've been so significant to us. And I, I dare say that if we ask you today what your favorite verse was, you may have a life verse, but you probably would say your favorite verse is the story of God's love in John 3, 16. But if you look at these 25 words, you'll see five pairs of two, 10 words, like the Ten Commandments like the very blessings of God that he places before us, the first two would be God and the Son. The giver and the gift. The author, God, and the finisher of the faith, the finisher of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Both eternal, though one stepped into death to come out on the other side of life. God and the Son. The second pair would be loved and gave. This is a glimpse of God's nature. You cannot understand God. You cannot define God unless you see Him as the one who loves. But a one that loves has to give. So we see the love that was necessitated a gift to be given. He gave the proof of that love. The third pair, God and the Son loved and gave. The third pair will be the world and whosoever. For God so loved the world. We're told that now there's eight billion people. All people everywhere. Without distinction and without exception. We may look at people and divide, but there's never been a soul that's ever been born, that's ever been conceived, 
that God didn't see value in. Because he sees value, his nature loves. God did not send Jesus to die for some. God sent Jesus to die for all. The world, for God so loved the world, that whosoever, now that's different. It doesn't mean that there's universalism. Simply because God loves everyone does not mean that everyone will be in heaven. But whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God knows each and every one of you individually. Every hair of your head, every thought in your mind, every mistake, every wrong choice, every humble beginning as if you were the only one in the world, as if you were the only one in the world, His love would still come to capture you. God, Son, loved, gave, world, whosoever, believes, have. You see, the, the one who believes has the hand of faith that reaches out and stretches out to God to receive. And when they, through belief and faith, reach out to God, they will find God's hand delivering salvation back to them. And they will have the life of contentment. They will have eternal life. And the transaction will be complete from Christ to you, the hope of glory. You don't lose it. You have eternal life. And that brings us to the last pair of words. Perish. Can I pause and ask you, is there a, a more frightening word than perish? The opposite of that is life. Die in your sins or die in Christ. To have everything that God would want you to have or to have nothing that God would want you to have. It's the complete lostness of those who die in their sins or it's the eternal blessing for those who die in the Savior. Two destinies, heaven or hell. Two ways the broad way or the narrow way. And there's a great gulf that's fixed between the two. One has banishment. The other has bliss. One has horror. horror. The other has happiness. Two choices. Two results. Verse 17, for God did not send His Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. They're condemned now because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Did you hear me? God didn't send Jesus so that some would go to hell. God sent Jesus so that those who choose life can have it. Perish or everlasting life. At Bethlehem, the light invaded the darkness. The reason people hate the light is what 1 Corinthians 2.14 said because they'd rather choose darkness rather than light. Look in verse 20. For everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. <clears throat> so when they see the light, they run from the light. But in verse 21 it says, But he who does the truth comes to the light 
that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. You can either run from the light or you can run to the light. It's our choice. In the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said this, Ask, and it shall be given. But not unless you ask. When the wind of the Holy Spirit comes, and you sense its presence in your heart, and you feel the effect, you feel the woo, and you feel the love, you see your sin, you feel the condemnation, you know that there is a, a vast difference between the two. And it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter how much of the culture and the religion of this world you have. It separates you from God. Nicodemus, a good man that he was, could not earn his way to heaven. He needed the grace of God. He needed the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. He needed to reach out his hand in faith and find the hand of God and receive the gift of salvation. You either receive all of God or you receive nothing of God. You either receive eternal life or you will hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. And the truth of the matter is this. God is more eager for you to have salvation than you are to even ask for it. So I don't know your soul's difference. I don't know where you are in life. I know that many people have walked an aisle, filled out a card, been baptized, maybe taught Sunday school, Maybe they've done many things in the name of Jesus. Matter of fact, in the book of Matthew, it says that he will say to many, they will say, look at all the things that we've done for you. Look at all the things that we've done in your name. But yet, because they don't have Jesus in their heart, he will say, depart from me. I don't know the condition of your heart. But I can tell you the need is the full free salvation that comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. And if you sense, and if you feel the need, if you feel the Spirit calling, the wisest thing that you could do is surrender, repent, give your heart and life to God, receive His all, and let Him take all of your sins.